Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to session 8D. The topic of this panel is uh, prisoners of war and refugees during the Vietnam War. Uh, my name is Alan Berenberg. I'm a history professor here at Texas Tech. I, I'm not a specialist in Vietnam, but I work on uh, uh, the Soviet Union um, and actually work on a little bit on uh, forced labor and, and prisoners, so I'm, I have a lot of interest in, in, in both of these papers you're, you're going to see today. Uh, so I'll introduce our, our, our first speaker, um, Marcel Berni, um, who, uh, after serving in the Swiss Army, uh, studied history and political science in his hometown of Bern, Switzerland. Currently, he's a PhD student and scientific collaborator at the Swiss, Swiss Military Academy at ETH Zurich. His research on communist prisoners in Vietnam's American War took him to 14 archives around the globe. Besides researching and teaching, he is a passionate long-distance runner. Uh, and I, I, I will tell you that I tried to entice him to running uh, Lubbock's Marathon tomorrow, but I think, I think he can't quite fit it into his schedule. But anyway, uh, all right, Mar Marcel, it, it, you have the floor. Thank you. Esteemed colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, like uh, Alan already said, I teach strategy at the Swiss Military Academy. So I'm visiting from the old world and I'm lucky to be here and I would like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me to this conference. I've flown 15 hours to get here, so this is important to me. So early on during the recent American interventions in Afghanistan and Iraq, the question about the applicability of the Geneva prisoner of war protection on irregular enemy combatants arose. Special provisions on the one hand and semantic word creations such as, quote, unlawful enemy combatants, unquote, or, quote, illegal enemy combatants, unquote, on the other provided the pretext for the Bush administration in circumventing the Surge Geneva Convention, GC3, and the 1984 UN Convention Against Torture. Between 2001 and 2006, the CIA's detention and interrogation program tortured and abused prisoners under the pretext of so-called enhanced interrogation techniques, AIT, thus also abusing the far-reaching powers of the agency. In a secret memorandum from February 2002, President George W. Bush declared that the Geneva Conventions would no longer apply to alleged Al-Qaeda fighters. Quote, I determined that none of the provisions, provisions of Geneva apply to our conflict with Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan or elsewhere throughout the world because, among other reasons, Al-Qaeda is not a high contracting party to Geneva. Even though the executive branch provoked fierce criticism from military commanders, not least of all, they credibly claimed, they credibly demonstrated that the interrogation methods used were contrary to the law of war the top level of the executive branch prevailed. A similar debate, ladies and gentlemen, arose in the early stages of the Vietnam War. In fact, the Johnson administration deliberated about whether to extend full Geneva protection to prisoners, to prisoners of the People's Liberation Armed Forces in South Vietnam, commonly known as Viet Cong, as well as prisoners of the People's Army of Vietnam, Pavan, or NVA. Ultimately, the, Bush, Bush admi the Johnson administration decided to, to extend GC3 protection to all prisoners, at least theoretically. It was decided that, quote, in order to establish the proper framework for US compliance with provisions of GPW, it is prerequisite in all courses of action for the US to institute the following procedures with regard to all persons captured by its force. Full PW treatment to all persons captured until such time as their status had been determined by a US tribunal. This broad definition, stemming from the largely conventional experiences from two world wars, was difficult to apply to the hybrid insurgency in South Vietnam. Americans and their allies rarely faced a clearly definable enemy wearing a uniform. In practice, it became soon an open secret that the communist prisoners were frequently not treated according to the provisions of GC3. 
Major General George S. Prof expressed the frustration of many of his fellow GIs when he stated to R.W. Apple from the New York Times, quote, what we are trying to do here is to apply a conventional convention to an unconventional war. This thing, meaning the Geneva Convention, was written for large-scale land combat, not a guerrilla war. However, a broad assignment of POW status remained the official American and allied policy, including during the period that I would term as South Vietnamization. In fact, the commanding general of the US Military Assistance Command Vietnam, in short, ComUS MACV, Creighton W. Abrams, continued with General Westmoreland's extensive granting of enemy POW status. However, in particular, the coordination and compliance of the Army of the Republic of Vietnam, ARVN, and South Vietnamese police with GC3 persisted as a hotly contested and controversial issue before and after Vietnamization. The Rubicon was crossed on February 1st, 1968, when amidst the Tet Offensive, Associated Press photographer Eddie Adams, together with an NBC cameraman, captured the last moment in the life of Nguyen Tan Dat. Adam's shot became the front page news symbolizing the brutality of an unpopular war. Ostensibly, many American and South Vietnamese soldiers perceived prisoners to be worthy of treatment according to law only if they themselves fought according to regular, conventional, and civilized rules. If this was not the case, as in South Vietnam, the opponent, hors de combat, could become a target of violence in combat situation on the one hand and in re-regions on the other. In juridical terms, North and South Vietnam had both signed the Geneva Conventions. However, the North questions their applicability to enemy prisoners. In particular, captured American soldiers were seen as pirates or serious criminals who were not entitled to the treatment of GC3. Hence, the National Front for the Liberation of South Vietnam, NLF, did not sign the Geneva Conventions and created its own rules for dealing with prisoners. Representatives of the NLF responded to a letter of request from the International Committee of the Red Cross, ICRC, dated 11 June 1965, as follows. These conventions contain articles that do not correspond at all to our situation, nor to the organization of the NLF, uh, of the NLF's armed forces, and that is why the NLF cannot apply this convention mechanically. In February 1966, the NLF broke off all contact with the ICRC. On the contrary, already on August 10, 1965, US Secretary of State Dean Rusk had confirmed that the United States would apply all Geneva Conventions in Vietnam and expect the parties at war to do the same. During the war, the MACV and the United States Army Vietnam, USRV, issued a wealth of official decrees that were closely based on the Geneva Conventions and international humanitarian law. Field manuals such as FM 1940, maybe I can pass this around, Field manuals, directives, regulations, pamphlets, pocket cards, and other guidelines were drafted in order to regulate the treatment of captives. Even though the MACV revised such guidelines constantly during the war, they could be overruled by commanders with recourse to military necessity. However, all soldiers had to abide by the principle of respondeat superior, meaning that superiors were responsible for the deeds of their subordinates, and mens rea, meaning that criminal liability should be imposed on soldiers who were, of, who were aware of what they were doing, both juridical dogmas established after the Nuremberg and Tokyo war crime trials. Since prisoners captured by Americans were handed over to the United States Army by all service branches, the Army soon became the defining authority in creating the policy of handling enemy prisoners of war. MACV Directive number 190-3 established a, quote, 
responsibilities and procedures for the evacuation, processing, and accounting for prisoners of war captured by United States military forces or delivered to United States military forces by free world military forces." Unquote. The binary distinctions between prisoners of war and common criminals soon became obsolete, which is why the Macri introduced new captive categories. The term captive included not only prisoners of war, but also suspects, doubtful cases, regroupies, and returnees. The latter were granted preferential treatment under the Chiohoi program in accordance with Field Manual 31-16. Civilians who had been arrested by mistakes had to be brought back for release to the place where they were captured. So potential POWs could be classified as either suspects, meaning, quote, persons who when detained were not openly engaged in combat and who, whose status may be innocent civilian returnee, prisoner of war, or, civilian def or civil defendant. Also doubtful cases, quote, persons who have committed a belligerent act and whose entitlement to status as PW is in doubt. All doubtful cases must be resolved by a compet competent tribunal for a determination of status in accordance with Article 5 of the Geneva Convention rel relative to the treatment of prisoners of war, as implemented by MACRI Directive 20-5. Regroupies, Vietnamese who lived in what is now REN, meaning the Republic of Vietnam, and at the time of the 1954 Geneva Conference moved to the north, later infiltrated into RVN and were captured. And last but not least, returnees, meaning persons who voluntarily returned to the government of Vietnam control after having actively supported the Viet Cong in some form of political or military activities. North Vietnamese armed forces are accepted as returnees. So a lot of different categories. Only persons determined, uh, determined as, quote, civil defendants, unquote, by a military tribunal were placed outside the protection of the POW status and turned over to South Vietnam. From then on, civil defendants lacked the far-reaching privileges codified in GC3. In fact, the category of civil defendant was misused as the war continued. Journalist Orville Schell wrote in 1968, quote, Civil defendant is the vaguest and most poorly defined of the categories. Officially, someone who is suspected of being a spy, saboteur, or terrorist comes under this category. But actually, it is a convenient designation for anyone about whom the interrogation teams cannot make up their minds. These unfortunates fall into a limbo category. Therefore, it should come as no surprise that the majority of all prisoners in South Vietnam became civil defendants. One GI spoke bluntly in this regard. Any person can be placed in the category of a civil defendant. It is a catch-all. Before captives classified as POWs were taken to prisoner of war camps, officially known as Arvin Core Combat Captive Camps, the capturing units collected prisoners at small collecting points. These were mostly established at the regimental or divisional level. Collecting points were rudimentarily equipped, prisoners were held exposed to the elements, and the sanitation was rarely good. If enough POWs were ready at a particular collecting point, they were flown by the military police to interrogation centers or POW camps. Since especially at the beginning of the war, the POW camps were under construction, South Vietnamese authorities locked many POWs into civilian prisons. Once built, the supervision of POW camps was a South Vietnamese responsibility. Although US forces captured thousands of POWs, they did not retain custody of these prisoners. Instead, captives were turned over to the South Vietnamese government for internment by the Arvin, the National Police, or the South Vietnamese Ministry of the Interior. In 1965, the Macri and South Vietnam had set up six POW camps. The first camp opened in May 1966 in Bien Hoa, three core tactical zone, followed by others in Pleiku, two core tactical zone, Da Nang, 
I core tactical zone, Kanto four core tactical zone, Kino, Kinon two core tactical zone, and the largest in 1967 on the island of Phu Quoc near the coast of Cambodia. Where civilian prisoners, so-called civil defendants, were interrogated in provincial interrogation centers by South Vietnamese police forces and CIA personnel, POWs were questioned in 13 combined division interrogation centers, four combined core interrogation centers in Da Nang, Pleiku, Bien Hoa, and Canton, and one combined military intelligence center, CIMIC, in Saigon. CIMIC is on the left of this slide. The CIMIC was part of the Combined Intelligence Center, CIC, which was responsible for interagency intelligence. Like the Combined Core Interrogation Centers, the CIMIC consisted of a South Vietnamese and an American part. Officially opened on January 31st, 1967, the CIMIC interrogated promising POWs as well as deserters of the Chio Hoi program. Less important prisoners of war were interrogated directly in the field by military intelligence detachments. Um, or in interrogation centers in the rear. The CIMIC in Saigon therefore only had room for 63 inmates who were questioned in 28 interrogation rooms. Prisoners in the CIMIC were interrogated at least twice, once by South Vietnamese and once by an American interrogation team. These interrogation teams conducted 20,217 interrogations from January 1967 to April 1972. Little is known about the prisoner, how the prisoners were treated and how widespread torture was. Although the use of systematic torture was firmly denied by the South Vietnamese generality after the war, there are indications that torture was regularly used in the CIMIC during the early years of the war. From 1971, the ICRC or ICRC visits to the CIMIC and other South Vietnamese interrogation centers were only rarely allowed by the South Vietnamese authorities. High-ranking civilian prisoners, suspects, uh, high-ranking high civilian prisoners suspected of possessing non-military intelligence um, were interrogated in the National Interrogation Center, NIC. The NIC was located in Saigon and operated by the National Central Intelligence Organization, the CIO, which was essentially the South Vietnamese counterpart of the CIA. Together with the aforementioned civilian provincial interrogation centers, the CIO had set up a sophisticated network for interrogating civilian prisoners at the local level that bore, the CIA, that bore CIA's signature. In fact, four CIA advisors were present at the NIC to monitor interrogation orchestrated by the South Vietnamese CIO. Even less is known about the interrogation methods in the NIC compared to those in the CIMIC. No files have been released although I have filed a Freedom of Information Act request in 2015. After interrogation, communist prisoners not classified as POWs were sent to either one of four national prisons or to one of the countless civilian, provincial or district prisons. The national prisons were located in Chia Ho, Tu Duc and Tan Yep near Saigon and one on the island of Con Son on the archipelago of Kondao in the South China Sea. In both cases, national prisons as well as provincial and district prisons, these civil defendants were mixed with criminal inmates. The fact that the Allies captured more prisoners throughout the war than they released exacerbated the precarious, precarious space conditions throughout the country. During the war, there were few resources for prison construction. Instead, old prisons, some of which dated back to the French colonial period, were used. Even a CIA employee had criticized this procedure in 1967. Quote, first and foremost is the total inadequacy of physical facilities in being for either processing, holding, or imprisoning civil detainees. Such prisoners, or such prisons or prisoner compounds are, as exist are er enormously overcrowded and all categories of varieties of suspects, persons awaiting trials, uh, those already tried and convicted and so on, are crowded indiscriminately in these existing facilities. 
The national, provincial and district prisons marked on the map behind me were the cornerstones on which the regional South Vietnamese prison system rested. As in, as in national prisons, many communist prisoners complained of serious grievances, mostly about precarious space conditions and dirty cells. In an attempt to improve conditions in the provincial and district prisons, USAID launched an operation in which experienced American police officers and detectives were sent to South Vietnam. In return, South Vietnamese police officers were trained at the International Police Academy in Washington, D.C. from 1963 onward. So let me conclude. A better war. In recent de decades, Louis Sorley's term has become synonymous with U.S. strategy during Vietnamization. With regards to the treatment of enemy prisoners, I would, however, argue for continuity. There was no difference in the treatment of communist captives by American and South Vietnamese before and after Vietnamization. Allied prisoner operations in South Vietnam were incapable of reversing course. The term communist prisoner remained an externally applied designation for prisoners captured in South Vietnam. Few of these were die-hard communist prisoners of war. Hence, American and South Vietnamese authorities classified most of them as civil defendants. These were mostly civilian detainees who often had the misfortune of being in the wrong place at the wrong time. In my research on communist prisoners in the Vietnam War, I find that contemporary categories are seldom trustworthy. Take for, take for example the official number of communist prisoners of war in the Vietnam War in 1972. 37,000 451. Yet during the same time, some 200 to 300,000 additional civil defendants were held in South Vietnam. Although legally these prisoners were not classified as POWs, it seems hard to argue that they would also have been in captivity if there had not been a war. What I would like to briefly argue here is that historians should be critical of categories employed by military or civilian officials. At first blush, this may seem counterintuitive. However, uh, often established categories seem to provide an easy way for studying the experiences of captives. However, I would like to submit that based on my research, quite often contemporary classifications and categories say more about the governing authority than about the captives themselves. Linguistic and cultural differences were among the reasons why the United States and South Vietnam never developed a common understanding of enemy prisoners and their intelligence potential. Where Americans were particularly interested in the interrogation potential of prisoners, Saigon saw them as pawns for negotiations on the one hand and traitors to their own cause on the other. Thus prisoners of war had a difficult lot a general lack of interest led to the undersupply and neglect of many. Hunger, rampant diseases and preca precarious space conditions were only some of the consequences. In addition, there was torture and mistreatment by soldiers and camp personnel who were rarely prosecuted by military law. Before and after Vietnamization, virtually no effort was made to utilize POW labor. Prisoner exchanges were a rare exception. Those in possession of valuable intelligence were sent to either the NIC or the CIMIC. As for the camps, visits by the ICRC had little effect upon camp conditions, despite American pressure to obey ICRC requests. Poor responses by the Vietnamese during the entire war and countless accusations of war crimes did little to heighten the world opinion of the Allied war effort in Southeast Asia. War crimes in dealing with prisoners are documented on all sides of the Allied campaign, in particular by soldiers of the Arvin, by civilian employees of American and South Vietnamese intelligence outlets, and not least by South Vietnamese police forces. Similarly, frequently GIs have witnessed or committed acts of violence against prisoners during all periods of the war, in all core tactical zones, and by representatives of almost every division. At least in this respect, there was no better war in Vietnam. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.
All right, our next speaker is uh, Gerald Waite, who is currently working as a research fellow in the Center for Peace and Conflict Studies at Ball State University, focusing on Vietnam and related research. Mr. Waite is retired from the anthropology department at Ball State, where he taught for 18 years. That work, combined with a strong interest in Southeast Asia, dating from his war experience there, has formed the groundwork for a lifelong relationship with the people of Vietnam. In 2004, he received the Cohen Peace Studies Fellowship for work entitled the Post-Revolutionary Village, which allowed him to live in Vietnam and conduct a research project in a village he had lived and worked in as a U.S. Army Civil Affairs Officer during the American War era in that country. Since that time, he has organized six student veteran research trips to the region, edited three student written books about the country, and maintains ties with a variety of friends there, as well as membership in Veterans for Peace. Number 160, Da Nang, Vietnam. And his paper today is entitled uh, Vietnam 1969-70, Pacification as a Path to Nowhere. Thank you. Uh, this is from a longer paper, one I hope to get published at some time. So I've shortened it. And at last count, I had it down to 18 minutes. So I'll try and keep it there. My students always say that I meander, that I start on a topic and then go elsewhere. And that's bad, I guess, if you're in a place like this where you're supposed to keep it on time. So I'll read and try and stick to topic. OK, modern warfare has its greatest impact on civilian populations of densely populated, strategically contested areas. Interpretations, interruptions in housing availability, land usage, food production, educated and family life are but a few of the problems faced by people who find themselves in a war zone. The generic term used to describe people faced with these situations is refugee. This status as a displaced person can last anywhere from a few days as it did for some people and for many years as evidenced by the existence of refugee camps on the Cambodian-Thailand border from the killing field era of the 1970s. The United States Committee for Refugees estimates refugee numbers in the tens of millions with annual resettlement potential only available for about 5% of those affected by forced migration. The displacement of agrarian or land-based peasant populations disrupts the basic cultural mechanisms necessary for these societies to replicate themselves. Refugee status for these people becomes a sort of liminal or transitional state that may necessitate a complete reordering of cultural values and behaviors. For many people, the migration into other societies provides an escape from refugee status. One example would be the large Vietnamese diaspora through which Viet people displaced by war and the ensuing reunification of the North and South have been dispersed throughout the world. For others, the solution to their status is a return to the land they once inhabited, but with different survival strategies. It's the latter case that I helped guide and participated in during the war in Vietnam and have researched. In June of 1970, I was assigned to a project entitled the Gonoi Resettlement, in which 1st Marine Division wanted to move several thousand refugees from various camps in their area of operations to a previously occupied inland island called Fuki or Gonoi. This island, an area of about 2,500 hectares completely surrounded by rivers, lies 25 kilometers south of the city of Da Nang, approximately in the middle of Quang Nam province. Built in prior to 1965, it was one of the richest areas in the central part of Vietnam. Primary sources of income were from raw silk production and rice agriculture. The island had a pre-1965 population of about 17,500 people in 12 or more autonomous villages spread out over the islands 11 kilometers east to west. These villages were then further dispersed into hamlets ranging in size from few houses to several dozen houses. Many of the people I talked to who had originally come from the island said that people there were quite prosperous. Uh, 
and well established with many brick and masonry homes. Even though I was never physically on the island before it was cleared, the brick and mortar fragments left from the bombing would seem to bear this out. Between 1965 and 1968, Gonoi was an area hostile to the government of Vietnam and American forces in Vietnam. Marines in Quang Nam province nicknamed it Dodge City, an indication of its growing reputation of as, as a place of firefights and casualties. The island lies in Dien Ban province, which has been, or Dien Ban district, which was labeled one of the most contested areas of i -Corps. The first major operation against the VC infrastructure at Gonoi, entitled Operation Mead River, took place in November of 1968 as part of an accelerated pacification program. This operation, manned with Marines and soldiers from the Army of the Republic of Vietnam, or ARVINS, and National Police, cordoned the area, interrogated the residents, detained those that were deemed possible guerrillas. The rest were allowed to go home. The operation did not succeed in securing the area. In June of 1969, the government of South Vietnam and allied forces of Quang Nam province decided to clear the population from Gonoi and render the, uh, and I'm forgetting my PowerPoint, and render the area uh, useless to opposition forces. Leaflet drops were, con were conducted informing the people that the area would be bombed and that they should leave. By July 1969, Gonoi was cleared of its original inhabitants. Artillery shelling and bombing reduced the island to pulverized dust resembling a moonscape devoid of flora and fauna. Gonoi was 12 kilometers from the south end of the Da Nang runway. Most of you or many of you know that Da Nang was the busiest airport in the uh, world for that period of time. And planes would take off every, every 60 seconds going to Hanoi but if, or going to Laos, but if they, there were cloud cover in both places, they wouldn't come back with a full bomb load. They would drop those bombs on Gonoi on the way into the airport. So it, they were actually in their final approach when they dropped their bomb loads there. So um, in April of 1970, the Vietn American and Vietnamese military commands created a return to village project on Gonoi as a joint endeavor. I went to live on the island on June 17th and remained there until September 30th of that year. First Marine Division had assigned a Marine engineer officer to the project and the province chief had assigned a South Vietnamese captain as the officer in charge of the project. There was a civilian from the Agency for International Development or its subsidiary Civil Operations and Rural Development Support called CORDS. Initial plans called for the resettlement of 17,000 refugees on the island. This was approximately the number of people dislocated from the area and spread out in various refugee camps in Quang Nam province. Gonoi Island was considered at that time to be a model for resettlement. It was one of the first attempts to move a large number of people from refugee camps back to the land. It created home ownership once again for people who had been deprived of their homes, and it provided some land usage, if not land ownership. Several facts became clear early on in this project that set the tone for later developments. Even though the GVN numbers were large on paper, the refugees that were allowed back on the island were small in numbers. The first hamlet called Phu Lok at the easternmost point of the island was the only real focus of the project that ac could accommodate no more than 2,200 people at best. It may have achieved a population that large at some time, during the project. However, most of my counts reflected a population between 800 and 1,000. Even though the GVN initiated the project, most of the materials and resources utilized were from 1st Marine Division and CORDS. The people who were moved back to the island had absolutely no resources, no money, no food, no implements, no seed, and very little hope. Individuals were randomly picked from the refugee camps without regard to family affiliation or hamlet of origin, loaded in trucks, and dumped in the area of Fulak. 
actually they were dumped on the far shore of that river and were ferried over in small boats. Uh, there was a village chief appointed by the district chief at Dien Bon. However, in my dealings with him, even though friendly and eager, he seemed to have no influence over anything connected with the village. Another villager told me that he was a well-to-do farmer from another place near Dien Bon who had no connection to Fulak other than a political appointment from the district chief. Most of the people in Fulak early on seemed to have a little connection to the island. I tried to get people to help me mark pre-war grave sites so that I could plot roads around them, but no one knew of any. I found several on my own as I mapped for roads and access to the village and assumed at that time that the people of Fulak came from a different part of the island. The need for security surpassed all other requirements in the construction of this hamlet. Rather than the traditional hamlet structure spread out in the fields, Fulok and later a second village called Fu Fong were ordered on a straight line of houses that permitted open shooting lanes or fields of fire between houses, specific straight line boundaries that allowed easy visual access to the comings and goings of people in the hamlet. And then the large expanses surrounding the hamlet cleared of any vegetation. The settlements took on the appearance of the strategic hamlets of the Xiem Nu era of the late 50s. These became fortified hamlets of a different nature than the earlier villages. This was an area, er, this was an era known as pacification for which the principal metaphor was winning the hearts and minds. However, the real deal obviously could be seen in the number of people carrying weapons. Fulak had security provided by a U.S. Army military advisory team of six men and an accompanying regional force, RFs, and popular force, PFs, company of over 100. A Marine Combined Action Platoon, or CAP, of seven with a People Self-Defense Force, PSDFs, of 40 or so armed teenagers. A detached, marine, a detached Korean Marine Company of 200 and various military types like myself, the Marine Engineer and South Vietnamese Project Officer. Many times in the five months I lived on the island, there were more people carrying guns than hoes. In his Foreign Service, foreign service Reminiscence, a guy by the name of Fritz stated that one night the VC came and he wasn't there. Old men, women, and children armed with shotguns and grenades met them at the perimeter of the hamlet and drove them off. Anyone who ever lived in these villages knew that old men, women, and children weren't armed with anything other than hoes and the occasional pitchfork that hadn't been already been taken from them. On the night in question, the regular military forces did most of the fighting. The Vietnamese captain got wounded, medevaced, and never came back to the island. The PSD, PSDF with their Thompson submachine guns and carbines disappeared into the night. Clearing the island for habitation and farming was actually a bigger job than we first expected. The entire ground surface was pockmarked with thousands of bomb craters. There was unexploded ordnance everywhere which had to be found and cleared before bulldozers could be brought over and used. Even though ground was eventually cleared and leveled for growing, very few people had resources to plant anything, and to this day, I'm not sure that the government ever distributed any land to the people who moved there. I believe it may have stayed in the hands of the district chief of Den Bon or some of his friends. First Marine Division donated irrigation pumps to the village, but no one tried planting any rice in the first year, during which time the pumps disappeared. The second village of Fu Fong was started on the 10th of July west of the first village, but no land was cleared other than for the village proper. No more than 100 people ever tried to live there. Security was not as good as in the first village, and the court's project officer was killed by a landmine in August, a death which effectively terminated most of the building efforts. An announced visit by South Vietnamese President Chu to Phu Lok focused most of the attention on that village at the expense of Phu Phong. During the month prior to that visit, roads were surfaced, a school was built, flagpoles were erected, wells dug, and some fields were planted in vegetable crops, although August was not necessarily a good month for planting. 
Funds were allocated to purchase books for the school and it was in use during Chu's visit, but shortly thereafter it became a storage building for the district chief's rice and the kids were run out. I counted 800 and 1,838 people living on the island during Chu's visit, but I never saw that many people after that time. Um, oops, I'm doing the wrong thing here. Before I go on, that's the school right there. And people there still remember me as the lieutenant who built the school. That's how I'm remembered. Um, no one at the site or the government really put much thought into how people were going to live or where food would come from. The Marines donated ship dunnage from the harbor in Da Nang and a marine engineer sawmill. We used the sawmill to cut lumber for housing and sold it for about 2150 American for enough lumber to build a one-room house. Since none of the villagers had any money, we set up village work crews with marine and province supplied funds where people would work to get enough food and get the money to buy a house kit. People worked in the sawmill and the only non-Viet was a marine who operated the saw itself. People worked in the village helping construct houses and digging wells. Much of the heavy work such as the construction of a non-standard bridge, roadways, and field clearing was done by the Marines. As a civil affairs officer, I set up, uh, I'm sorry, I'm uh, behind. This is uh, looking down the main street of Fu Lock. And um, so I'll jump now to this. As a civil affairs officer, I set an unexploded, I set up an unexploded ordnance disposal program with money given by the Marines. I employed children of all ages to find unexploded bombs and ordnance of all types, which were then blown up in place. The kids were paid piece rate with higher prices paid for larger bulldozer damaging bombs. This in turn generated another source of income for many of the families in the hamlet and often some food too. On the days when I had C4 left, I would use it to stun fish in the many small ponds created by crews, thus giving the kids some bonus protein to take home. Um, these kids, I'm sorry. Well, maybe I'll get it right. Okay. That's Sui, that's the girl right there. I still know her. When I go to Gonoa, she comes and finds me. Uh, that boy right there is still alive, although he claims to never known me. But his father is the party chairman there now, or was at least a few years ago. And so his father was VC at the time. And so, in order to maintain peace in the family, he probably claims he didn't know me. But he, uh, the kid there at my elbow, he was killed. There's a particular, particularly pernicious type of bomb called a bombi. It's the size of a baseball, but it weighs a couple of pounds and is very deadly. And they don't arm because they don't turn enough times in the air. So they land and they're waiting for somebody to kick them or some kid to pick it up and throw his buddy a curveball and the guy that catches it, it goes off. And he was killed by a bombie in that way. They were told, never touch him. And actually when I would blow up a bombie, I blew up 2,500 bombs in the first month I lived there. Uh, but when I would blow up a bombie, I would take a quarter pound of C4 with a 20 minute timer on it and I would just about tiptoe up to it, set it very carefully on top of the bombie pull the uh, timer, pull the, pull the cap, and tiptoe away. I would never even touch them. Um, anyhow, okay, and back on that slide, one more thing. My students always say, well, who's that skinny kid with the gun? <laughs> they, I tell them, you just lost a letter grade. <laughs> anyhow, um, Peasant economies and their accompanying mechanisms are deeply rooted to the land. The first order of business in market economy assimilation is separating village inhabitants from their native environs. No one closely involved in the war effort really understood what we were doing, but it couldn't have been done better with pre-planning. 
the search and destroy operations and the refugee movements of the war effectively denied the VC and the NVA the use of real estate and just as effectively denied most of Vietnam's rural peasantry the same access. Carl Pogliani writes that separating man from the land is the first requirement of the market economy and that in modern colonization the social and cultural system of the native must first be shattered. Americans repeated the 19th century process that had proven successful with Native American populations. Removal and resettlement to secured areas, hence refugee camps, resettlement hamlets, and reservations, was deemed the answer to an uncontrollable security situation. However, enhanced security and manageable hamlets were not the only outcome. Once peasants were removed from the land, many of the mechanisms that supported their reciprocal social organization were weakened, but still present. The patrons and the landlords were gone, no one in the camps had more wealth than anyone else, and land ownership and name only is a liability if it can't be farmed. Kin structures still existed, but with resources being scarce in the camps, reciprocity was minimal. The final blow to peasant culture came in the form of an indiscriminate scattering of people back to the land. Kin were separated and neighborhoods no longer existed. The nuclear family was dismantled because the men were detained as potential guerrillas or drafted into the GVN armed forces. People in resettlement hamlets were a mix of people from all over and more strangers than an American subdivision. This put everyone at the mercy of the market economy. Without the protective mechanisms of the original village and the reciprocity structures therein, survival was dependent on the individual's ability to find a way to support him or herself and whatever dependents were with him. Crafts, cottage industry, vegetable farming, wage labor where available became the stock and trade of people who had once supported their families entirely with monoculture of rice. The structural layout of the village was also urban and foreign. Even in resettlement, people were still separated from the land they'd once lived on. The traditional layout in the area of Fu Lok was an elongated cluster of houses following a footpath north and south in close proximity to individual land holdings. The resettlement hamlet was laid out with only security in mind, and the cleared zone around the hamlet put vegetable gardens and other land-based enterprises about half a kilometer from those who might have worked the land. Because of this distance, people were reluctant to start gardens and rice. Removal, resettlement, then served to limit revolt and force peasant assimilation into the larger economy. James Scott calls this passive adaptation. Strategic hamlets and resettlement projects only intended to address the revolt part of the equation. The idea of separating peasants from the land, limiting their connection to it, and forcing the resulting assimilation process came as an unattended consequence of movement to a secure military outcome. Thank you. I'd like to commend both of you for, for staying on time. That was remarkable, even though we had lots of extra time. That was some, those were some great, uh, um, rich, but compact uh, presentations. Um, I'm not going to comment for very long, um, as this is far outside my area. And I think also it's more interesting to, to, to get some questions. But before we get started, I just want to draw our attention to some common themes and perhaps offer, offer a, a few questions for each of our presenters. Um, despite the fact that uh, seemingly these are these are disparate topics, um, POWs and, and the resettlement of refugees, in fact, we see here a lot of commonalities um, in in the way that they approach this and in, in the themes that, that come out of their presentations. Um, certainly one of the most important is the, the gap between policy and practice, mm. right? Uh, w what happens when states and militaries uh, place, uh, try, try to implement policies um, in, with actual people in in complex environments, and and how how the practices often diverge very far from the policies. Um, although, of course, sometimes the policies in, are, are written in ways perhaps deliberately to allow wiggle room. That's a, another uh, question um, we perhaps we'll consider. 
Um, and, and of course, also the, the gap, the, the difference, an interesting question about the difference between intended and unintended consequences, mm -hmm. right? Which we saw, especially in, in the last paper, how sort of I, I, perhaps I, I ironically uh, that the, the program was more successful than it was even designed to be because of, because more because of unintended consequences mm -hmm. rather than the actual intended consequences. Um, uh, also, language and categories. Right. What is the importance of language and categories, in, both in the formulation of policies, but then how historians approach sources? How do we get away from uh, the limitations of the often euphemistic language um, uh, that, that is in the sources, but also how do we, how do we, how do we become aware, to again, go back to James Scott, um, of seeing like a state? <laughs> And, and, and avoid seeing like a state, uh, right? Use, use the sources um, in, in ways that avoid uh, uh, trapping ourselves within these rather artificial boundaries that, 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 they, that they impose on us as historians and scholars. Um, uh, a few questions for, for Marcel. Um, so he starts off, you, you start off your paper in this very provocative way by talking about the Bush administration and POWs, which of course is a great hook, but I'm interested in hearing more about the prehistory of this. I mean, uh, you know, so where where does this where do these policies come from uh, that the U.S. and others try to implement here? What are the what are the precursors in other conflicts? You know, I, I think I think especially from given my experience as a Soviet historian about the Second World War, all right, and and where where also where again uh, POW policies were were. Uh, contested and implemented very um, unevenly uh, uh, across across the conflict. Uh, I was also really surprised that POWs weren't used for forced labor, mm. um, and so I'd I'd love to hear more about or weren't used much for forced labor. So I'd I'd love to hear more about um, why why that is. That seems rather unusual, especially given that you know um, f you know forced labor is not only common. Uh, with the use of POWs, but also uh, it's one of the most important parts of the Geneva Convention, yeah. right, is, is the regula regulation of that. Um, push you a little further on this notion of language categories. So if, if the categories themselves are misleading, how do we get away from them? How do we see past them? How do we get beyond uh, these, these uh, you know, the, the civilian uh, to civilian defendants, defendants. Yeah, yeah, right. How do we how do we get beyond civilian defendant to drill down and see who these people really were and and and, and what their what their experiences were like? Um, I mean, it really brings us back to this this question: um, What is a POW? Yep. Because actually, you know, we you know, it's it's very easy to 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 be critical of those who who adopt these categories in very kind of instrumental ways to allow them to to do what the, what they want with any kinds of population. But you know, at the end of your paper, you get back to so 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 how do we treat these people then who clearly are not POWs, but um, many of them, but were uh, were imprisoned because of war? What does that make them? Right, and how, how should we how should we think about them? So I, I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. So uh, moving on to 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 our to our second paper. Um, so uh, we we end this paper talking about the the this resettlement scheme and, and comparing it to a, a Native American uh, reservation system, for example. Uh, and and that's a that's a fascinating and very provocative comparison, but. Um, I'd like, I think there may be more opportunities for looking at the kinds of uh, the roots and influences on, these, on this kind of resettlement project. Um, it strikes me to, uh, at times, to uh, look an awful lot like a military colony, um, the notion of the, of, of, the, of the order, of the extremely ordered space, um, for, for, for example, um, concentration camps also as a, as, a, as a possible point of comparison. Indeed, um, one wonders, to what degree was this forced labor? To what degree, w it, it certainly seems in your description, and this may be partly be my ignorance, like that this was, a, this was involuntary resettlement, um, at least to some degree. So, so, so to, what, to what degree is this a village, and to what degree is it something else? Um, it, it, you know, uh, military colony, concentration camp, uh, you know, all these, all these other different kinds of, of, of categories. Um, I'd also like to hear more about the ostensible ideological goals. 
I mean, you, 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 su you suggested that in this fascinating way um, a market economy is created. Um, uh, was that an actual ideological goal of, of, of the policy? Was, was, the, was it purely done for security's sake, or, or, there was, or was there also a, a kind of utopian ideological component about reshaping um, peasant society in this you know, extraordinarily, one might say, kind of American way of, of, of creating the market economy? Um, and uh, finally, um, if it is about creating a market economy, what it, where does the role of corruption play here? Um, and also, um, which of course is a part of every market economy, but, but also it, perhaps it was a market economy, but it's a really strange kind of market economy, right? It's a market economy where most of the inputs come from, uh, strange is kind of a funny word to put on it, but um, it's where, all the, where the, the, all the inputs of, of money come from outside, right? Come from uh, not from um, agricultural activities, but from, you know, the, the essentially military inputs as, as, far as, I, as far as I can tell. So I just like to hear more, more about that. So uh, with that, um, I'll open, open the floor to questions. Um, perhaps we want to collect a few at first and then we can give them time to respond so we get more of a conversation going. Can we maybe just first um, try to ask uh, to answer your questions? Or I, if you'd like, yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah, go yeah, ahead. Keep, yeah. It, uh, keep it simple. Okay, okay, yeah. <laughs> I think that's better, well, right? we, can, we can do that and then let's, let's you know, don't worry about answering all of them yeah, at yeah. first though because we want to make sure to give people a chance to, to, to ask questions. So go ahead. So yes, the, the history um, of excluding irreg irregular guerrillas from the laws of war is, uh, has a long history, and I would argue that the civil, civil defendants of the Vietnam War are the illegal enemy combatants of the global war on terror today. Um, this sort of uh, thinking that the Geneva Conventions are largely a product of the two world wars, where you had regular standing armies, and it was clear who is a prisoner of war and who not, and suddenly if you have a huge guerrilla force uh, on the opposing side, what are you doing with um, civil defendants, with civilians who take up arms, who are not clearly um, detectable and who cannot be pressed in this black and white um, terms of the Geneva Convention. That's um, a dilemma that hasn't been resolved until today, I would, I would strongly argue. So you can go back to the Philippine-American War, you can go back throughout the ages and always see that uh, an enemy that doesn't fight in a civil or in a, in a civilized, um, regular way, that they are mostly um, become the target of violence, not only in the, uh, in, the, in the combat situation, but also in the rear regions, so in, in interrogation centers, in POW camps and, and so on. So this history is, uh, is, is very long and it's gonna stay with us for a while, I would, I would think. Uh, forced labor, you're absolutely right. There is no, um, no uh, huge exploit of forced labor. I can honestly not say why that is because these POWs, I mean, we're speaking of 200 to 300,000 of civil defendants, they would have been a uh, huge uh, potential of, of uh, forced labor. But for some reason, South Vietnam doesn't use them, and I haven't come across a good answer to that, unfortunately. So I can't answer that question. Um, third, the categories. So I would say we, we should uh, be careful with contemporary categories, and that's why in my dissertation I only speak of prisoners, so sort of putting all captives into one uh, category and uh, not even uh, try to differentiate too much because every attempt to, to do that is, from my perspective, doomed to fail because it doesn't uh, represent the, uh, the way <coughs> these, um, these fighters saw themselves. Um, they don't fit in a, in a Western style um, differentiation of, of POWs versus non-POWs or however you want to call them. So I just speak of, of um, captives. And you see that also in a very nice um, um, book by the United States Army Center of Military History. It was written by uh, Jeffrey Clark, and he says that all of these terms, detainee, captive, prisoner of war, civil defendants, whatever, are used in a, quote, chaotic, uh, chaotic manner, um, like so many other terms in the, in the Vietnam War lexicon. So I would li leave it with, uh, with Clark. Uh, 
and argue that it's better to just speak of prisoners. Um, okay. Uh, there were a couple, of, you had a couple of really, a um, couple of complicated questions, but we called this place the human zoo because it was just exactly that. It was a concentration camp. People couldn't leave. People couldn't do anything. People did uh, collect scrap metal and sell it to some scrap metal dealer who came. There was a lot of scrap metal in all the bombs I blew up, a lot of it. But uh, they really, they didn't have much transportation to go anywhere and they couldn't leave anyhow. But it was more like a concentration camp. I, uh, in my anthropology career, I studied Southwest Native Americans, the Navajo and the Apache, and then Vietnam because of my experience in Vietnam in 1970. And to me, it was a natural conclusion. The reservation and the resettlement village were the same place, just the ex almost exactly the same, except the reservation now has progressed over what it was in the 19th century but the reservation and the resettlement village are still very similar in a lot of aspects. So I thought that was a, I thought that was a good analogy, um, and a very fitting analogy. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think that anybody intended to create the changes in peasant society that they did. The fact that the Marine Corps sent us irrigation pumps, no gasoline, but <laughs> irrigation pumps, uh, said that somebody was thinking that we would maybe put people back on the land and get them to raising rice again, but it just wasn't possible. Security was the main thing. It was security, security, security. Like I said, there were more people carrying weapons than there were carrying hoes. And it was just, uh, you know, even, you know, I like to, I'd like to tell you that building a school was important, this, that, and the other was important. But keeping the place secure was the most important thing. And the second village where the uh, cords officer got killed, my brother-in-law torched that uh, right after I left country. He was a helicopter pilot. His squadron took fire from that village. And he, uh, I think he was delighted to send me an email, or not an email, sent me a letter at the time, but said they torched Fu Fong. <laughs> and, uh, that, but it was all about security at that time. Thank you. All right, let's open it up to, qu to questions for, th for the panelists. Yes. There's a microphone over there. Do, do you want Go ahead. Oh, there. No, it's, it's yeah. yeah, you got to, you need to use the mic because they won't, that's the only way they get you on the tape anyhow. So um, the question about uh, CMIC? The interrogation reports. Um, I just got to say, if you're doing the Vietnam War, they're absolutely fantastic. I mean, I learned so much about what the communists were doing to the Ten Offensive from those reports that you would never have gotten anywhere else. And given that that was kind of my focus in the period um, when I went to the archives, curious, what can you say about the interrogation reports before January '67? Because I, I thought I had seen reports maybe before that time, but were they under a different authority? Do, do, you, do you have, I'm just, just wondering, do you recall under what organization, or what the, 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 you know, the title, the header would be, you know, prior to 67? Because I know that RAND was doing things, but it's not, they're not, that's not the same thing. Yeah, so RAND is doing the M&M &M that we heard yesterday, the, the big M, um, Viet Cong motivation and morale study, mm -hmm. but that's um, less um, like the classical POW interrogation. It's more like um, how does the Viet Cong tick? Um, and it's, it's a very holistic um, <coughs> kind of um, data collection. And you're right, there were interrogations um, sort of like later in the, in the CIMIC before 1967. But I haven't found any uh, reports. Uh, I know that there were because they get mentioned in other uh, reports and, and in um, documents, records. But I haven't found um, any concrete evidence of um, interrogations uh, that were like in the CIMIC before. So I don't know. If okay, well, yeah. then I'll, I, will, I will go look because yeah, sure. you know, the story of intelligence 
during that period, you know, is important because we're, MACV is really trying to spin up and so much of the C mix are about order of battle. Yep. Right. You know, what unit, where did you go, who was your superior officer, what was his name, that kind of thing. So. And later on, there is this famous order of battle controversy between the CIA and the MACV, obviously, yep. which um, plays into that, yeah. All right. Thank you. Uh, Robert Anderson, writer. Um, the natural question is, what about the possibility of escape from these camps? Uh, where, what, 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 was that a, was that a real problem with? Them? Oh, uh, no, not that. No, that's this for the other. Sorry, uh, I'm talking about the POW camps. Okay, say that again. The possibility of escape okay. from these of camps. Of escape. Yeah, yep. it was that a real problem? Yeah, um, well, two camps were based on islands, uh, Fukuok and Konsan, so it was difficult to escape from there. But unfortunately, on one island, there was a relatively large uh, Viet Cong, popula or Viet Cong um, party um, or, or fighters. So they uh, tried to attack the camp, um, and there were um, prisoners who could escape. But on the other hand, um, they were very safe, and it's was not, it was not a problem that uh, that persisted because um, the POW camps were, were were very strong and and built in a in a fashion that you couldn't escape that easy so it was rare rarely very rare it was rare yeah okay. and and as far as chords go um, of course mr. blowtorch Comer and his and his big sh his big uh, uh, push to make chords a part an integral part of the war effort um, can you talk to me? What was what was? Did they ever finally realize what they were doing to peasant society in Vietnam? Did they ever come to a realization that it was unworkable and it was just destroying the peasant society around? With you said of uh, with cords, with cords or or with your group. Um, um. Did, I mean, did anybody ever come to the realization that, you know, look? Not really. Not really. I mean, courts may have known what they were doing, but we didn't know what we were doing. I'm an inf I was an infantry officer. Right. I could, uh, I could do a pretty good job on uh, teaching an M16, M60, M79, M72, right. whatever. But, you know, to go out there and build a village, I didn't know, even though I had some college, I didn't know squat about what I was doing. And I didn't realize until many years later what the real outcome of it was. Um, you know, I'm, I was actually pretty fair at security, village security. But right, right. as far as building a village or understanding how Vietnamese lived before we were there, yeah. I didn't know anything. You know, we should have... Uh, they should have made, made us read Hickey, hmm. you know, Gerald Hickey, Gerald Cannon Hickey before we went. They should have, you know, we were going to be in a job like that. We should have had to read that right. or study that or understand something about peasant culture, peasant society, and how that was really supposed to work. I mean, did anybody ever think about the American Revolution, which was largely a peasant organization? I mean, the Minutemen and, and the Patriot. I, I, mean, I, don't, I think it was discussed. I don't know for sure. I don't really remember. It just remember. strikes me that, you know, the analogy was so striking there that, you know, uh, anyway, thank you. Yes, sir. I, uh, I am Gu Huynh Nha Vu. Um, I came from the North of Vietnam. Uh, I am a former uh, Vietnamese political prisoner. Uh, actually, I, 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 I have been working for the Vietnamese uh, communist government for a long time. Um, but after that, I spoke out for him, human rights, for democracy, and, and then uh, uh, 10 years ago, I was arrested uh, and, and imprisoned, sentenced to seven years uh, uh, in prison, something like that. OK, um, 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 I, I have a question uh, for uh, uh, Dr. about uh, uh, prison of war. Uh, so, um, um, uh, um, during uh, the Vietnam War, there were some uh, communist spy, spies who were arrested yeah, um, uh, by, by Thiel uh, government. 
uh, by the uh, government of uh, Republic of Vietnam uh, because the CIA at the time uh, told them that, uh, that, that they, 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 uh, they are communist uh, spies. But after, because the kind of counterintelligence uh, conducted by, by, by Vietnamese communists uh, and, and uh, that made the President Thiem uh, believe that uh, uh, despite that, that not communist, they were kind of uh, uh, from uh, um, anti tm anti theo political faction. And because of that, uh, uh, Theo uh, finally released uh, these uh, uh, really communist spies. And in the case, these uh, men, uh, they were arrested and imprisoned. Uh, my question is that how, uh, how, how do you call that kind uh, uh, category of prisoner? Because uh, they, they first uh, they were arrested and imprisoned as a communist kind of uh, prisoner of war. But after uh, yeah, they were uh, uh, released because, uh, yeah, uh, like, uh, like I said, because uh, President Thiem um, did not believe them as a communist. I think that's exactly the problem that you have so many different agencies and different actors and everyone has a different understanding of what a prisoner is. So um, contemporaries, of course, said a spy cannot be a POW because he's a civilian prisoner, so he would be a civil defendant and he would not be uh, protected by the Geneva Convention because he's a civilian. Um, you're right, there were many spies um, that were um, put into prisons or interrogation uh, cells in South Vietnam. There's this famous case of the guy that was put in a Snow White cell because um, White had this um, aura to be unhealthy to many Vietnamese and um, he didn't talk during one or two years of interrogation, so that's quite astonishing. And um, yeah, so, so spies were important, they were... Um, put into cells, but a lot of uh, communist spies were very hard nuts to crack, so to speak, and uh, that's why maybe they also were released because the interrogation teams were just, um, couldn't, couldn't get the information out of them that they wanted. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the papers. My name's Mike Morris, I'm from Texas A&M University. My, my first question is, reference uh, the 1967 edition of Field Manual 1940. If you were rewriting that or, <laughs> or arguing for changes to it, what's the most important thing that should be changed in that manual based off of your research? Well, I think one of the problems for officers in the field was that they were constantly revised during the war. So there were um, new editions being written as the war continued. I understand that this is standard procedure, that you want to um, update and that you want to make them in effect better. But still I think that created a lot of confusion on the ground because you never knew which edition um, applied at the moment. And, uh, and so I would, I would stop with that. Um, I would uh, be uh, granting POW status to all the prisoners. I know that's easier said than done and I would try to convince the South Vietnamese to use um, this policy um, more aggressively than it was done. Okay, thank you. The, the reason why I think it's an important question is because uh, I think as historians it's fairly easy for us to fall into the trap of, of being critical of yeah, absolutely. You know, a, a document or something uh, with the wisdom of hindsight yes. and it's very helpful to walk a mile in the, you know, in the shoes of the person that's trying to develop and execute the policy. Um, and uh, having done a little bit of, of both, and uh, I, I just, you know, I, I think it's, it's useful for us to... Um, I totally agree. It's a lot easier to, for us to criticize this yeah. in hindsight than to have yeah. done it. Yeah. Uh, but I, I appreciate, you know, your, your response. And, and the other question I had uh, for Professor Wade is referenced Operation Mead River, which you alluded to, and it has a reputation. Um, for not only failing, but sort of failing spectacularly. Uh, what do you attribute that to? Uh, you know, what did you know at the time, or perhaps what have you learned since? 
Uh, I've just shared with you pretty much everything I know about it. It has a bad reputation, but I don't know why. If you could shed some light on, on why it didn't work as designed or intended. Uh, just the fact that it didn't work. They didn't, um, there, the village areas that they tried to clear were tunneled. And so they didn't, uh, there, were, there were VC and NVA. The, the island was split into two areas as far operationally by a railroad track. And the western half was called the Arizona Territory. The eastern half was called, the, was called Dodge City. But there were tunnels underneath the villages. They didn't clear the villages. They didn't totally, in the search and destroy operations, Mead River didn't burn houses and basically clear people off like they did in 1969. In 1969, they cleared the place and then bombed it heavily. And there were two other operations before that. Pipestone Canyon was one, and I can't remember the name of the other one. But uh, those in those operations, the Marines and then later the Marines and Korean Marines took very heavy casualties. As a matter of fact, uh, it's some of the most, some of the uh, heaviest casualties that the Marine Corps took in any one place in Vietnam. And there's still markers out there for Marine ghosts. The people say not all the Marine ghosts have gone home, so we want to make sure they're fed and don't trouble us. But the, <laughs> the, um, I, Mead River was probably, the, we probably weren't aggressive enough. It was just uh, 5th Marines, I'm not sure which battalion, but it was 5th Marines, the Arvin and the National Police, and they cordoned it off and then questioned people and let people go back to their houses. They didn't uh, aggress, they weren't aggressive enough to figure out what was going on. So it was business as usual the next day. They were mounting attacks from there. The, next, the very next day they were mounting attacks on Hoi An and the airport and other places. Thank you. Actually, if I can interject a little on, on the first question, you know, about the about you know treatment of POWs, it also assumes that you have partners who are or you yourselves are implementing them in good faith, yeah. <laughs> right? Which is a, another kind of open question. Um, and also allies. Yeah. Allies. Yeah. yeah. So again, uh, Eric Villard again from CMH. Just to follow on sort of question. Um, after the Abu Ghraib scandal broke, you know, in, in, uh, during the Iraq war, uh, they actually asked me and a few other folks to research it. So I spent about six months doing a paper on detainee operations. <clears throat> and one of the things that struck me is uh, looking at the contemporary McAfee records is there were many, many, many examples. I mean, before, you know, at all points in the war, talking about, you know, from, from McAfee saying this is how we should treat POWs detainees, and there's even laminated cards the soldiers theoretically would have saying, these are the Pocket things, cards. procedures. Yeah. So, so, so I guess my question is, um, there can be a gap, right, between what is policy and what is execution, because if you went and just looked at the wreckage, you'd be like, wow, they're all, they're all over this. Soldiers are getting read the riot act about this, you know, all the time. But then when you talk to most of the soldiers, like, I don't know, I never, <laughs> you know. So um, sort of maybe comments on, you know, discrepancies between what is written and what is done. Yeah, I totally agree. This is a very important point. There's a huge divergence between juridical uh, theory and military practice on the ground. Um, you see this also that war crimes towards POWs are seldom reported. They are either kept within the unit or maybe the division, but they never or they very seldomly get um, go to court martials. And if they go to court martials, most of the um, the, the soldiers that are accused get um, get uh, get free uh, in a very short time. Um, so the 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 prisoner per se is not a person that is at the top of the mind of many uh, generals or of many um, important military people. Um, and I also think that we have, we have a, a problem with this divergence that there is a high um, dark figure, so there is a high number of unreported crimes, uh, especially towards prisoners. 
and there's a big gap between what de jure was um, um, was needed or was written in all these guidelines and, and field manuals and pamphlets and pocket cards and what was uh, finally done on the ground. So this is um, a huge divergence and um, soldiers just didn't care. I'm sorry. Many, many GIs just thought about themselves, their units, their outlet and what to do with enemy prisoners was not that important. I'm sorry. That's yeah. the feeling that I get. Because uh, you may have heard about this, the Winter Soldier investigation yeah, yeah. in 71, and I actually, um, f before Nick Turris wrote his book, I yeah. actually found those files. Um, but again, that's what you, usually it's, it's like al allegations, but then a we lot have of people come forward to say, well, let's try to verify this. Most of them, they, they just said, we're not saying it didn't happen or did, we, we, we don't know. No one's willing to come forward and corroborate, and so. But you're totally right. I, I had a look at all the 250 mm -hmm. Vietnam War Crimes Working Group cases. Mm -hmm. yep. Um, yep. They're collected at the National Archives. Uh, fabulous resource. But especially with POWs, the trials, uh, the, or the accusations never went to trial. Or if they go to trial, then the uh, alleged perpetrators are um, free in a very short time or they don't get um, court-martialed at all because they have some sort of um, way to get out of the, of the judicial um, um, way of, of doing things. But um, so that's very important. And also the Pierce Commission has also um, mm. a huge um, number of, um, of good resources. Um, and then you also, of course, you have oral history like uh, the Veterans Against the War, um, and and other um, yeah. teach-ins, for example, yeah. But it's a problem. There you have a huge source problem because a GI or an anti-war protester says something and you cannot really uh, justify these yeah. because it's just an, an accusation. Yeah. And sort of the final comment on this is I think it might be of interest to folks. Uh, I did find one example in there of the, of the reporting of the infamous, people have heard this, taking POWs up in helicopters, and right? them out, yeah. pushing one out so the other will talk. It's called the long step. Right. Again, personally, uh, okay, I don't think that ever happened. And if it did, the person who went out the door was already dead. That's my feeling. And there wasn't a guy in the helicopter. Maybe there was a guy on the ground. C complicated reasons, but you think about it, you're implicating all the helicopter crews and everyone else on a war crime. And if it's a prisoner, I mean, they have ways of making people talk. But I'm just, anyway, I. Happy to see the one, but again, uncorroborated. There is one picture actually, actually of the of the long step where you can see. Uh, I'm not sure if it's a prisoner or a dead body falling out. Yeah. So, right. yeah, was he dead before he got yeah. thrown? Out? <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> well, um, I just have a. I'm just a little puzzled. I, you're uh, talking about um, prisoners of American forces. There were also prisoners of. Uh, of, of uh, South Vietnamese forces. Uh, you, I'm sure you made that distinction, and I'm simply puzzled as to where you made that distinction. Uh, it simply, I, I didn't quite get it. Uh, and if you could e explain how, the difference between how they were treated and what, what became of those who were held by the South Vietnamese and those who were held by the Americans. Also, when the Americans largely went home, were their prisoners turned over to the South? I assume they were turned over, or, if, or, or perhaps, perhaps freed. Maybe you could talk about that. And the, uh, on, the, on, the other, on the other paper, uh, you mentioned how everybody should read Gerald Hickey. He, of course, was an expert on uh, uh, the Brews and tribal people and all that. Uh, how, I'm not sure how that applies to where you were. I mean, yeah. obviously, you think it does. Uh, I just, I just not. Yeah, his that. first book in 1962 was *The Village*, and it's, uh, it is a rice farming village in the Delta. Okay, so and it's it's considered as the Bible by many people uh, that work uh, in Vietnam and work around Vietnam villages. Okay, but what what happened in 1962? Um, the war was a quite different then. Then 1970, yeah, 70. It was a really different kind of war, wasn't it? Well, it was the yeah, but that wasn't about the war. That was about the composition and makeup okay, of okay. family social structure and village social structure, okay. and village religion. Basically, how the village worked. Okay, 
Well, thank you. Now, beyond all that, I wonder how, how much you think it's been returned, restored to as it was before, uh, since 1975. Over the years, have, has this, uh, have the old ways, uh, have the old formations of society managed to restructure or, or return to their yeah, families so come together again, groups come together again, et cetera? Families have come together again. Uh, groups, different extended families. The extended family is the most important group. But families have come together. They have actually, even though the current government has tried to separate them in some cases, families have coalesced around family temples and family areas. Uh, I, I'm actually uh, going to be talking about that in Korea in uh, November. But the, uh, I've been back there. I've been back there 16 times since 2000, oh, okay. and looked at. That's what I. Uh, when I lived there during 2004, that's what I was doing. Was looking at the ways in which the village has come back from where it was during the war. Okay. So, so prisoners are um, captured by the Arvin, by the mostly the Marines and the Army from, of the Americans on the American side and by Free World Military Assistance Forces. Uh, if the Americans capture a prisoner, he's turned over to the Army. If the South Vietnamese capture prisoners, he's kept within the South Vietnamese um, channels. Um, prisoners from all service branches are turned over to the Army on the American side and then from the Army to the South Vietnamese. So that's how it works, at least theoretically. And um, most of the prisoners are released after 1975. A lot of POW camps um, um, get uh, liberated by um, the reunification forces. Some of them are sent straight into re-education camps because they were seen as uh, traitors to the communist cause because they didn't fight to the end. And uh, yeah, then they were in another prison, so it's to speak. It's like in the Soviet Union. Then. Yeah. So that's what happened to many former POWs is they would end, they would then get f end up in the gulag. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Well, um, I, we're at the end of time. So um, th I want to thank our panelists for a wonderful and fascinating presentations and also our audience for very engaged and, and thoughtful questions. So thanks to everybody. Thank you.